Greta Gerwig's Barbie just smashed into theaters last weekend and had one of the biggest opening weeks of the century. This film is nothing short of a phenomenon. Let's break everything down about it. Hello, movie friends. Welcome to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. And today we are breaking down Greta Gerwig's Barbie, which I was so shocked how much I actually enjoyed this film. It was fun. It was insightful. It had some things to say about our society and culture, which I really liked. And at the end of the day, it was very emotional, but just a great time in the theaters. I was laughing my ass off throughout the entire film. I absolutely loved the movie. I also had a terrific time at Barbie, and I was open to any kind of film. My expectations were, what is this going to be? What's the tone going to be like? Looks like a lot of fun, and I had a blast at this film. And I think that Greta Gerwig just proved this past weekend how important her voice is, not just for cinema, but the experience in theaters. This event that Barbenheimer created every time I went to the movies the last week, I've just seen an ocean of pink. And this <laughs> This combination of Barbie and Oppenheimer, this organic marketing campaign that studios will study forever. They'll never be able to replicate, even though they're going to try so much to put two movies together. They're going to be like, hey, what are you releasing that's like a kid-friendly movie? Because we got something super dark. What's your date? They're going to be, I bet they're going to be collaborating. It's not going to work. It's not going to happen because what happened with Barbie and Oppenheimer is just so natural and unplanned. And the meanification of it was was insane. You can't plan for this. And... Barbie is one of the biggest hits opening week-wise of the entire century, and that's factual information. Let's go over the box office. Fact check true. Fact check true. On a budget of $100 million, in just five days, it has passed $400 million at the global box office. By the time this episode comes out on Thursday, maybe it'll be at $500 million, $600 million. Again, on a budget of $100 million, its opening weekend box office gross broke $300 million. It's Monday was the is the new record holder for a Monday at the box office of your opening weekend. 26.2 million just on Monday, which broke the Dark Knight's 15-year record for most on a Monday of your opening weekend. Wow. And now Barbenheimer is the biggest theatrical weekend since Avengers Endgame. This weekend surpassed Spider-Man No Way Home, and we haven't had sort of an event experience since Endgame, since No Way Home, so it's been a few years. I mean, these are... Yeah, I can't think of like the last, um, like you said, you keep saying event movie, and that's a great phrase because this is a movie that people are just, they're dressing up for, and they're posting online that they're going to see it. It's not just like just another one of the franchise films. Like, this is like something else entirely, and it's it's kind of like the, it reminds me of the Minions yeah. uh, fad, I would say. that You could say this the last time since then with the, the boy showing up for Minions, in such a huge capacity online dressing up for it. It's kind of that same organic, you know, turning it into a social event, not just going to the movies, not just, you know, enjoying the, watching Barbie or Oppenheimer, but making it a huge communal experience for everybody. And that's the whole point. And, and it kind of um, it's this beautiful thing where it connects people. And from all walks of life, everybody's dressing up for Barbie and Oppenheimer. It's like that's, that's the beauty of cinema. And that's the beauty of going to the movies. And that's why, you know, this weekend was so important after like a lackluster year so far of box office. There have meh. been a couple of good move, good hits, just a handful, but there have been a lot of disappointments in the box office. So the rejuvenation and the excitement, especially after the past month where people were just like, uh, about the last several movies, this was so great to see. And I think it was just a, a wonderful thing to see, even like a lot of young people like getting excited to go to the theater and dress up for it and turn it into an experience and that's sep- it's separating itself from watching a movie at home which i think is really important for especially young kids growing up if they want to become movie fans or get interested in film it's important to show them that like you go to the movies and it's an event it's a thing it's an experience it's not just like let's put something on on apple tv yeah that's why i was so excited i've been to the movies like four times in the last week and a half Ocean of pink every time. Our theater was an ocean of pink. It was a blast. We dressed up. Anthony's wearing powder blue. I'm wearing pink. In our Two Ken pieces. era right now. I'm Ken, my Ken Look energy, at your sunglasses. Energy is off the charts those are right some, now. So those are Ken glasses for sure. So cool. Yeah. Now I love when he put the sunglasses <laughs> over his sunglasses. <laughs> There's so much, I really enjoyed this movie. It's the funniest of the year for me. IMDb Barbie is at a 7.5. Ron Tomatoes. It is a 90% audience score. 90% critic score. And just a quick synopsis that I I wrote up for this film. 
Barbie lives in Barbie land, the most wonderful place in the world where Barbies have the best days of their life every day, hold all the important jobs, and keep their Kens on a short lease of obsessive admiration. <laughs> They've also successfully solved all the problems of feminism in the real world, or so they think. One day, stereotypical Barbie has an existential crisis about her life and soon discovers a connection with the owner of her Barbie in the real world is causing her to malfunction. She sets out on a journey with her persistent Ken to the real world to find the little girl and cheer her up. What could possibly go wrong? And the film was so well made and crafted. The production design was outstanding. Uh, the Barbie Land sets were remarkable, and they built everything. They even built those transitional scenes where they're traveling through the ocean. They're traveling across the ocean on boat. They're flying through space, uh, traversing the Arctic on sled. All of those were real sets that they actually built, and it's just wonderful. It's like very Wes Anderson esque, because because of the the world of Barbie Land, they're able to make l things look artificial to make the audience, and it still makes sense to the audience when it doesn't it doesn't have to look perfect. And that artificiality, the plastic quality, the the vibrant colors, the pastels, I love the production design. And what's really cool is there were no actual blacks or whites for colors used in any of the sets of Barbie Land. It's all colors, pastels, pinks, blues, whatever, everything. And I thought it was just an incredible production design, but they built the, everything. So they used the Leaved in Studio sets in the UK, which Warner Brothers has used for many of their films. They have huge sound stages, like massive, massive sound stages where they can build all of these things. And it was just, it made all the difference in the world, especially all the dream houses. They built all those Barbie dream houses, and each one of them were over 25 feet high. And Margot Robbie even did her own stunt of being lifted down um, and floating down from the Barbie house. And Kate McKinnon's Barbie house is my favorite. Um, it had actually, it actually had holes hidden in inside the set so she could hide her real leg. And she <laughs> kept putting up she, so she could put up the prosthetic leg because her splits were just hysterical throughout the film. Uh, Barbie's car was actually real too, and it was actually remote control operated by a member of the crew off screen. That's what I figured. Yeah, she, Margo's just like hands free she's driving, not driving, but and going then, uh, so slow. Yeah, and that it was actually electric, and so Ken's Hummer was electric too, <laughs> which I found so funny. And then the flamingo uh, mailbox outside Barbie's dream house also doubles as the electric charging station for her car. The the set design was wonderful. There's so much, um, so many nods to the toys from the past whether it be the hospital set that was like re re modeled after the, the real hospital set toy like the car yeah the uh no when uh when ken gets hurt beaching yeah wasn't it like an su like an ambulance pulled up oh yeah and it ambulance opened it up, and then it yeah. opened up and like that was a real toy so i think that uh referencing all these old toys as well as the old outfits when they would do the freeze frames of the outfits i i found that to be just so much fun and someone who i know nothing about barbies except for the the, the small amount of time each week we spent um, taking turns playing with our, our our niece when she was a kid. She loved Barbie, so she had all the outfits. She had a bunch of sets. So we have a, a little bit of a history playing with Barbies, but not quite the same as, you know, young girls growing up in America where there are so many different to toys, so many different dolls, so many different outfits, so many different appliances and houses and things and vehicles that there's just like a whole world. And Greta and the team did an amazing job of putting that into the film so that it's just like all these Easter eggs that you see a movie with tons of Easter eggs in it. Um, but then you see this and it's Easter eggs for the toys that girls grew up playing with. And I thought that for not being familiar with it, I could see why girls would really see so many things that from their childhood. Yeah. Production design was done by Sarah Greenwood and she was terrific in this. She's done Anna Karenina atonement wow. sherlock holmes beauty and the beast so she is just terrific and one of the unsung heroes of this film of course greta and bombach writing the script together and greta directing obviously an incredible film unique and clever and just nothing you ever seen before but i think sarah greenwood was so integral to this movie working so well in addition to rodrigo pietro who is martin scorsese's cinematographer uh mexican film uh, it's pretty good mexican cinematographer <laughs> And he actually heard about this film while shooting Killers of the Flower Moon with Scorsese while they were in Oklahoma in production. And Greta kind of just like reached out to him and offered him, would you be interested in shooting this film for me? And I think him and Sarah Greenwood are the secret sauce to this movie working so well aesthetically. You know, he created a unique color palette for this film with the production design team, basically calling it Techna Barbie <laughs> after mm -hmm. the Technicolor format. 
Well, it's ironic because it, it reminds me of uh, The Wizard of Oz. Yeah, kind of. And yeah. in addition to the many versions of pink in this film, so many different colors and variations and shades of pink, Rodrigo incorporated Rosa Mexicana, which is Mexican pink. It's been associated with the bugumbula flower color and ornamental climbing plant. It's very vivid, saturated, and almost purplish pink. It's that very vibrant pink that you see in the film. The original reference are the colors of the pigment variations used in typical garments and other objects like artifacts or basketry of the traditional Mexican culture. So infusing his own kind of culture, the importance of pink in Mexican culture into the film that he's shooting just added so much of his artistic voice to the film, and I think it looked terrific. And uh, the, the lighting was actually very specific. If you if you watch this movie again, you'll notice that all of Barbie Land is all na- artificial light. There's no sun. There's no uh, fire. So Greta envisioned Barbie Land of having as having no elements. So there's no wa- that's why there's no water. That's why there's no fire. That's why there's no weather. There's no wind. There's no actual dirt. The waves are plastic. The waves are pl- <laughs> so there is there are no elements of no earth elements in Barbie Land, and since there are no elements, there can't be any sun. There can't be sunlight. So all of the lighting is just artificial, and it's not it's not until they enter the real world where we finally see. Um, natural, real lighting, real light from from the sun or from natural lighting in different regards. Uh, I found the lighting to be just be really perfect for this fantastical world, this place that is built on plastic and dreams and imagination, and completely separate from the real world. And but- then the lighting becomes very obviously different throughout the course of the film. But then um, they have amazing instances of duplicating natural light like the uh, plastic campfires <laughs> during the push song i want to push you over. down well i will well i will <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my favorite sequences but that's like where they're imitating natural light from fire with the the fake campfires so they did a wonderful job lighting the film i love the magic realism of this world because <laughs> i interpret it barbie land is a representation of the imagination of a child and plays to the rules of the imagination of a child playing with Barbies. I think that's what Greta's going worth, going with. And I love the Barbie dream houses and you know how Barbie floats down from her house to the ground rather than using any stairs from her dream house, which it does not when you look at the Barbie dream house sets in the movie. This is a nod to the fact that early earlier Barbie dream houses did not have stairs. Instead, they had that slide that went down into the backyard or into the swimming pool. And basically, I think that's an interpretation of a child just picking up her Barbie and placing it, picking it up from the top of that dream house and then dropping it down. So I'm envisioning just Greta's Barbie land plays by the rules of a child's imagination while they're playing with Barbies and, you know, Ken smashing the plastic waves and floating up and down. It's like if you smashed a Ken against the wall and (laughs) it flew around everywhere, the food's not edible. There's no water, even though Barbie goes in the shower and the second time she goes in, the water's cold or the food gets burnt. She can't eat anything. She doesn't drink anything. So really tapping into the rules being the imagination of children, which is really fascinating. I think it was one of my favorite parts of Barbie Land. And also one of my favorite parts was Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Barbie. Just because that's what girls will do when they play with Barbies. They say, hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. Hi, Ken. <laughs> and so that's an, that's also an interpretation of, like, girls or kids playing with Barbies of just each one. Because a girl will have, like, I remember our niece specifically, she had, like, 30 Barbies. And she had outfits for all of them. She, you just always be like, hi, hello, I am, I'm Barbie. This is this Barbie. And it's really like how kids play with the toy. And so Greta infused that perfectly into the Barbie land. And it's the entire thing is an interpretation. It, it's a realization of kids playing with the toys. And that's why, you know, if, if guys are getting butt hurt when they watch this movie, because the, because the Kens are the losers, it's, they're not saying that men are nothing. There's, this is an interpretation of girls playing with their toys. So obviously the Kens are always ignored and because it's Barbie. And then there's Ken. Barbie Land. And yeah. we'll get more into yeah. the is this an anti man yeah, yeah. movie. But that's the whole that's the whole point. It's like Barbie's the the star it's and then Barbie Ken's Land. just there when they're playing with their toys. You know, Ken's just there. He's you know the com- <laughs> they're the platonic companions of Barbie when they allow it. Exactly. And it ties <laughs> to why Gosling ended up signing on to the film. I think everybody's seen this on the internet where well, after they had uh, a meeting and discussed the part Gosling found a his Ken his daughter's Ken doll face down in the dirt next to a squeezed lemon, <laughs> and then he then he understood the character. I think when he saw that he's like, okay, I get it. And then he texted her that I shall be your Ken for his story must be told. That's that's what this interpretation of Ken is. Um, we'll get into that more as well. 
But also, going back to The Wizard of Oz, I when I watched this movie, I was like Wizard of Oz the whole time. 100%. It's really incredible, the the references to it. Uh, first of all, the world, obviously. But then also, the, when I saw The Pink Road, I was like, that's it's just like the yellow brick, yellow brick road. It reminded me of it so much. Also, the heels, you can compare it to Dorothy Slippers. It's very Even similar. the Birkenstock. Yeah, very similar shots. Um, and then also... Barbie's dress, one of the dresses she wears, is very reminiscent of the frock that Dorothy wears in The Wizard of Oz. So I think that they purposely made a lot of nods to Wizard of Oz because they took the approach of, ironically, that the first Technicolor film, obviously the reference to that, um, and really infusing what they did with The Wizard of Oz almost 100 years ago now um, and putting it into this film. Then also there's another classic movie that had huge reference to this movie, and that's The Matrix with the Birkenstock and the heel, the red pill and the blue pill. So the the heel is obviously the blue pill where Barbie just wants to go back to normal and forget everything. She's like, I'll take the heel. <laughs> uh, the heel. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, I was just giving you the the choice isn't real. You have to, you have to do this. You have, then still the Birkenstock is the red pill of waking up and finding the truth of the world. So I love those two references to two movies that I really love. I think my favorite references were probably to Greece. Especially with the Ken dance. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh yeah, my yeah. goodness. The that Ken was, dance is great. The Ken yeah. Warren dance, I think, was my favorite part of the movie. Same. And we'll get into that in a little bit, but I want to talk about more on production end. So when Greta Gerwig took on Barbie, she insisted on certain bonding experiences for the cast members, including a cast slumber party and movie churches. All of the Barbies were invited to stay the night at a London hotel. And the Kens were allowed to stop by, but not stay. <laughs> Gosling apparently couldn't make it, but didn't want his absence to go unnoticed. So in his place, he sent a singing telegram in the form of a Scotsman dressed in a kilt playing the bagpipes and reciting lines from Braveheart. Every Sunday, the entire cast gathered at the Electric Cinema in Notting Hill, because this was shot in London, for four months, I believe, mm -hmm. where they watched movies relevant to the Barbie storyline. The group began to refer to the weekly get-togethers as Movie Church. <laughs> I love that. And there's another famous movie that Greta was clearly referencing with this film. That, that's Elf. And I, when, I, when the first trailer came out, I said, this reminds me of Elf. Uh, with the set design but then she took it a step further and you can compare barbie and ken's journey to the real world to buddy the elf's journey to new york bye buddy bye buddy so traveling through these beautifully like crafted fun pastel-y childlike sets it's really just like a journey and then you walk into the real world like buddy just ran he just eventually enters new york city <laughs> and then ken and barbie just eventually rollerblade into venice so i think that also casting Will Ferrell, clearly showcasing that this movie was heavily inspired by Elf, and Elf helped pave the way for it, just like those other movies. And I love when filmmakers not just reference a movie, but they even, they'll even sometimes even cast someone from a movie that they inspire them. Christopher Nolan casting William Fickner for David, The Dark Knight, playing that bank manager, because he used Heat as a major inspiration for The Dark Knight. Fickner's obviously in Heat as a major character, so I think this is an example of a similar thing where they love that film so much they want to pay homage to the film, and they're also casting a person from that film that inspired them. So I think Barbie and Elf share a lot of DNA, and I think that Greta... You and your friends are dead! You and your friends are dead! <laughs> <laughs> I think Greta perfectly realized with the tone that Buddy the Elf's... But that Elf set, it's like, it doesn't have to be explain too clearly how a toy can enter the real world real world kate mckinnon's character weird barbie keeps saying just don't think about it too much and that's that's really what makes the movie work just don't think about it it just it just is it's this is just a movie and then you take rollerblades to enter yeah the, the, it's just the path for barbie you don't land. have to explain it it's just the way it is and um elf did that perfectly and so i think greta was like you know what if we do the same thing with this it works totally better than trying to explain, oh, is there a device that turns them human or is there like some kind of magic spell that turns them human? McKinnon's weird Barbie's like, no, you just like, just follow this list and just go go on your journey and you'll be there in the real world. And I love that. And and I love when Will Ferrell's CEO, he's like, oh no, they're rollerblading. That's the first sign. <laughs> That's the first step. <laughs> I thought it worked beautifully. And the most obvious film reference of all is of course to 2001 
a space Audi, which I think was an incredible homage to Stanley Kubrick's classic, I think the greatest film ever made. And it was so clever to use this as an opening because it really set the stage for not only is this going to be a great movie, it's going to be a spectacle, and the production's phenomenal, obviously, from this opening, but also getting the thematic elements of deconstructing Barbie and dolls in general for children, for girls, immediately within the first couple of minutes by showing with the narration from Helen Mirren, which she was terrific. I honestly wanted more Helen Mirren. I wanted her to show up. I bet you there was more that they probably cut out. Maybe, yeah. Because when she uh, broke the fourth wall, basically, and spoke to the audience, like, if you're trying to get the point that Barbie's ugly, don't cast Margot Robbie (laughs) in this role. (laughs) Note to producers. I'm not pretty anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, don't cast Margot. She's prettier without makeup. (laughs) (laughs) But showing, really, what the main themes of this film are going to be when it comes to dolls and the effect that they've had on girls and children growing up, how, for the longest time... Girls were forced, or not forced, but they were given <laughs> yeah. dolls as babies. They're only playing with babies forever as a way to prepare themselves for motherhood, for being a mother, for womanhood, for a family, rather than playing with the dolls that they actually want. So they were always a lot of children for centuries just playing with baby dolls, but then Barbie came along, this artifact. I'm sorry, that a- girl uh, ironing. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, unless there was toys for doing something else. <laughs> oh my god, it was, it was pretty hilarious. <laughs> it's it really clever. But then this monolith comes, this artifact from a different world, a different dimension shows up, and these little girls are like, what is this creature? What is this thing? And it's a Barbie, it's Margot in a giant form as a representation of the monolith changing the ideas of what you can do with your life and what you can play with as, a, as toys and all the girls smashing their Barbies to pieces and then throwing one in the smashing air. Smashing the babies to pieces. Smash, smashing yeah. the babies to pieces and tossing one in the air for the great cuts. It was terrific. I thought it was so clever. And I really enjoyed seeing the tease of that like a year ago, but then yeah. finally seeing the full scene and what they were trying to do with it. I thought it was a really clever way to open the film, again, from a production standpoint, as well as this is what this movie is going to be about. It worked perfectly. And that outfit that Margot wore in that opening was actually from the first Barbie set. From what, 1959? So, yeah, I think 59. So it's accurate to like, this is the, just like how that toy, it was the first toy version of Barbie. It's like, it perfectly correlates to the history of the dynamic of the interpretation of what a doll could be for girls. And also, speaking of, you know, this Barbie being introduced to the world, it's this is a Mattel movie, and I think that it was pretty commendable for them to really just take the bullet and get ripped apart the entire movie. They got torn apart. Uh, Greta and Bombach did not hold back. They, they went after Mattel and its history and its influence on culture and its influence on girls, the positives, but the many negatives as well. And so I think that was it was pretty commendable for this big corporation to be like, you know what, go after us for two hours. Uh, we kind of deserve it. <laughs> and so I think so many other movie, uh, so many other corporations would do their everything they can to pre- to prevent any kind of um, bad press whatsoever. Not for a whole movie, maybe a couple lines yeah. here and there, you yeah. see that, but not the entire film. So I thought it was it, the only the only way the movie worked was because they let Greta just point a microscope at them and tear apart their entire history in a way. And for me, that was one of the the best parts about the movie, and it's a way of, you know, ultimately the end of the film is, you know, finding a new progressive way forward. Um, you know, Mattel is going to keep making toys. Girls and other young kids are going to keep playing with Barbies. We don't have to dist- we don't have to eliminate the the doll, but the doll can change and uh, its influence on culture can evolve in a better way. And so ultimately, that was like one of the main themes of the film, and they captured it really well. They put themselves in the guillotine, so yeah. you got to respect that. Although they will be moving a ton of merchandise, they are. <laughs> they're going to be. They like, are. They're probably make like ten billion off merchandise <laughs> this year. It's going to be absurd. But they, yeah, they put themselves in the guillotine, which was important for them to do because this film deconstructs Barbie in terms of yes, for years and decades they've shown. Little girls, you can be whatever you want to be. You can do anything. You can be president. You can be an astronaut. You can be a scientist. You can be a teacher. You can do this. You can do that. But they also have never recognized the societal impact on they've had on girls' reality in terms of living up to the aesthetic of a Barbie and the expectations of a Barbie. And they never really focus on what, how they make little girls feel, for sure, empowerment, but also 
I can't live up to the expectations of a Barbie. What if I can't do that? What if I can't look like a Barbie? What if I? What if this makes me feel bad about myself because I'll never be what my Barbie can achieve? And I think that's why the ending is so terrific. Where it's Barbie can be whatever Barbie wants to be, and Barbie doesn't have to be something specific. Barbie can just be going to her first gynecology appointment with her Birkenstocks on. What an ending! <laughs> and I think that that was really important to deconstruct and point the mirror at yourself as a corporation to see. Yes. We've always been empowering for girls and women for what they can do and be, but we've never really reflected on ourselves the mental impact we've had on kids in terms of can I live up to these expectations? But also, this movie, the main theme of the movie is fantasy versus reality. And like you just, you actually just said perfectly, you know, this Barbie is a Pulitzer Prize winner. This Barbie is the president. This Barbie is an astronaut. This Barbie is whatever. The problem is it's always been in the fantasy for girls and not in reality throughout throughout history you know what i mean and barbie's always represented a fantasy of perfection and, and the fantasy of doing these things but it's never showcased a reality of it for girls you know what i mean and that's why barbie land is a complete opposite in terms of the film and interpretation of the real world where in barbie land women hold all the important positions have all the power whereas obviously when we go into the real world in the film the patriarchy has all the power the men are in all the positions of power and exactly importance. absolutely and it, and there's some great dialogue with with like ruth's character the creator of barbie she's like the the real world is it's difficult and it's rough and it's complex um but the problem with mattel and, and i think this movie tackled the idea of fa how fantasy is sold to young people and even adults for money, for profit, uh, by the media and by corporations to buy products. And what what's, this, show, this film showcases is how that fantasy can dilute someone's interpretation of who they are, takes away their individuality, and takes, and takes away um, them possibly pursuing who they really are and who they have the potential to be. And it could be something completely different from what the media sells them, but they grew up with the expectations of what's sold to them as a fantasy. And so people try to live up to that, and people try to embrace that even if it's not right for them. So it actually goes both ways in this film, which I thought was brilliant. So in throughout um, traditionally, you know, media and corporations, when it comes to advertising for girls and selling products to girls, it's embraced extreme femininity. And Barbie is a representation of that. Cute things, makeup. Uh, look pretty, look thin, look cute, uh, pursue uh, girly things, you know what I mean? And then for boys and for men, it's play rough, action, carnage, trucks, 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 horses, beer. I mean, I think the, the references to uh, the media's push of extreme masculinity is so well done in this film because whenever we watch, like, football – it's like, how many truck commercials are there? <laughs> it's all trucks Chevy. and beer so, over and over and over again. Light. And then also just with the kinds of toys that boys play with, it's oftentimes, um, you know, action. It's, it's very strong toys. It's fighting. It's battling. And so the media and corporations in American history have always pushed the extremes of each gender as a selling point. A specific part of exactly. masculinity, a specific part of femininity. Exactly, exactly. That makes the most money. And that's why the film, it does such a great job. I think a lot of people, they're misinterpreting the Kens and the patriarchy and like making their- And horses. Their mojo yeah. dojo casa house, the horses, the trucks, the Hummers, Beer. the beers. What, it, what they're saying, they're not saying all guys are doofuses and love beer and trucks and horses. They're saying that this is what we've been sold as consumers yes. for our entire lives. is just like trucks, like horses, <laughs> like double sunglasses, ridiculous <laughs> outfits, beer, hanging with the boys, Mojo Dojo Casa House. That's not, they're not saying that's what guys are. That's what we've been sold, just like the Barbies have been, and girls have been sold their own interpretation of that. Ultimately, the, the, the ending of the film is about individuality and rejecting the fantasy and finding who you really are it goes and it goes both ways again where barbie you know she rejects the fantasy of barbie land she rejects being stereotypical barbie she wants to just be a person and see what happens and ultimately that's the end of the film and then with ken it's not being defined by the girl not being defined by what the media sells you it's ken is me i am ken i'm Knuff. who is that <laughs> i'm an i'm an individual and so, uh, for me, the ending of the film is about embracing individuality and rejecting fantasy that's sold to us. And the only way to embrace individuality and to become a person wholly your own 
is to break away and to become free. And that's why Barbie frees herself from Barbie land and leaves Barbie land. And I think that Greta and Noah did a great job showcasing what a lot of men and boys grow up with that maybe he's never talked about in film is the obsession of wanting to be in the gaze of a woman or being the gaze of a woman you're interested in. And obviously, Ken, he says in the film, the only point of my existence is when I'm in the warmth of your gaze. That's the only, that's the only reason why I exist. And I think a lot of boys and men, they grow up thinking that's what they need to complete their lives. They need to be in the gaze of women. They need to be admired by women because that's what we're told. It's what we're sold. But now it's it's important to just... Find out who you are and not just be obsessed with being in the getting the attention of a girl, getting the attention of a woman. And I mean, we're sold that in, as kids in TV and in movies all our lives of there's that perfect girl. It always works out in the end and they always end up together. But that's not that's not the truth. And that's not how things really work. That's not life. But unfortunately, um, boys are sold that like that girl. She's the one she's going to complete you. And if you don't get her. And if you don't make her uh, your partner or, or or marry her, your life will never be worth anything. And so um, I think a lot of boys, um, I've been through that myself, of uh, suffering through the idea of I can never find happiness if I don't get this girl in my life because I won't be complete until she's with me. And I think Ken's, the Ken's of this movie, it's displayed perfectly how they suffer from that. Exactly. They have no existence without Barbie's attention. It's sad, but it's true. Yeah. It, it hit me real hard. Oh, no, yeah. I, I definitely related me. to it. How about we'll run to our intermission, then we'll get back and talk more about Barbie. Sounds good. Now, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast before we continue is to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It's the best way for people to find us, for new listeners to get discovered, and to just chart better on platforms. On Apple, all you need is an email if you don't use iTunes to leave a review. And we also love to read out the written reviews that we get on Apple. And we're running a movie poster contest for everyone who leaves an Apple five-star review for us. You'll be entered into a movie contest with MoviePosters.com. All you got to do is partner. screenshot and damn it to us on Instagram. Yeah, your five-star review. If you've already left a review, you can just send us what you've already sent as your review if you've done it in the past. And also another great way to support the podcast is to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. This is a subscription-based platform to help support the show. We have five different memberships of support. They go from $2, $5, $10, $25, and $100. Every single tier has access to our weekly chat, which is exclusively on Patreon every Wednesday now, as well as a weekly bonus episode exclusively on Patreon. Every single tier has access, but we also have awesome perks that get better and better as you go up the tier list, like $10 gets you access to our Discord, $25 you get a custom episode, $100 you get a private watch party, you get to come on the show for a fun guest segment, as well as free merch and stuff like that. So thank you to everyone who is a patron for our show at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. And this episode, like always, is sponsored by our great friends at movieposters.com. Be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at MoviePosters.com to get 10% off your order today. They have a huge selection, pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their massive poster library. All sorts of sizes, framing, and even backlighting for your poster needs. They're also doing a movie poster giveaway contest with us. It's a bi-weekly thing. If you want to win a free movie poster from MoviePosters.com, all you have to do, like James said earlier, is leave us a five-star Apple review and screenshot it. DM it to us on Instagram. That enters you into the contest. If you've already left a review, you can actually just pull that up as well. If you just hit, if you just click the the button for leaving a review, you can screenshot that and send it to us as well. So you don't have to leave a new one. And that enters you into the contest, which we're gonna select a winner of next week. Good luck, everyone. And if you need some more posters, be sure to always go to movieposters.com with our promo code Raiders10. To get temps off your order today. They're sending us a bunch of new ones in the mail. I got this some good ones. Got, wait yeah. till you see what I so got. The wall is going to look completely new in about a week or two. So can't wait for y'all to see our new digs from MoviePosters.com. Now let's get into our intermission and start with the movie quote competition. Anthony, are you ready? Well, I was born ready. Here we go. Whoever said orange is the new pink was seriously disturbed. <laughs> Devil Wears Prada? No. I don't know. Legally blonde. Ah, uh, obviously. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> okay. Whoever said orange is the new pink is seriously disturbed. <laughs> the movie has so many great lines. <laughs> All right. This is tough because it's only, it's only three words, but I think you might be able to get it. I'm a mess. 
<laughs> Actually, <laughs> this happened to me last week too. Oh yeah, where I got a nosebleed, <laughs> and I referenced. Yeah, I figured it, I, it's very connected to you. <laughs> so I get being a messy and getting nosebleeds. Well, I get nosebleeds. nosebleeds when I'm stressed out, like heavily stressed out. And I, I, it happened when we got some bad news a couple weeks ago. So I was very stressed. Oh, out Oh, you that got a nosebleed that day. I got a nosebleed that day. Oh damn! So this is from Call Me by Your Name. This is when Elio gets a nosebleed. Correct. I'm a mess. Ow. What are you doing? My bubby used to do this for me <laughs> when I was feeling sick. Good one. Got it, man. All right. I knew you had I knew you'd get it. <laughs> Guess this movie release year. The House of the Devil. Early Greta role. She's got a great supporting role in this movie. I'm gonna go with two thousand nine. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's right. That's right. Okay. What year did The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy come out? That's an old one, I feel like. <laughs> this is going to make me feel old. <laughs> oh, my God. Most deaf. Is it Martin Freeman? Yep. Zoe Deschanel. Zoe, yeah. yeah. Huh. Early to mid-2000s. Helen Mirren's also in it. That's why I did. What a fun movie. 2002? 2005. Oh, I was going to say five, but I was like... But you didn't. But I didn't. <laughs> My head was saying 2005, 2005. You're going to trust your gut, bro. Sometimes, but it doesn't always work out when I do. That's true. <laughs> Movie pop quiz time. What film did Greta Gerwig and her husband, Noah Baumbach, meet while working on? Easy peasy. Not that that's not the name of the movie. It's called Greenberg. <laughs> <laughs> ben Stiller. It's really good. It's really good. It's, uh, ben Stiller plays uh, this guy who's like trying to. F- he's. It's great because Bombbox movies are about adults who are still trying to figure shit out. You know what I mean? <laughs> because adults are always yeah. still trying to figure shit out. Yeah, I think that um, movies sometimes too often portray adults of have of handling everything really well, but like his movies often showcase adults that are still just like they're just like kids sometimes, like trying to work things out you kind of end up going back to square one yeah, in a lot of ways exactly. in these movies and plots and greenberg's very much like that it's, it's like real life man sometimes you're back at square one when you were 16 i'm like what am i doing with my life mm-hmm. anyways yeah <laughs> yeah but ben and greta are really great together in that movie yeah they have great chemistry in it all right next up what did helen mirren win her oscar for it's <sighs> a good question what did she win her oscar for I feel like, was it this century? I think it was. I think it was this century. It's definitely not, it's definitely not, um, it's definitely not red. Red. <laughs> <laughs> it's red too. <laughs> it's red too. <laughs> oh man. I don't know, but I think it's the century. <laughs> That's your guess. That's I don't know, but I, I think know. it's the century. I don't, I don't know. The queen. The queen. Probably the most famous portrayal of Queen Elizabeth. Yas Queen. Uh, before the crown, I think. Maybe. Well, actually, I still say, I mean, it might be the most famous. Possibly. Yeah. Probably. All right. Do we have any Raider haters this week, Anthony? And subscribe. Raiders. What do we got? Raiders. And I'll, get a, I'll get a five star review going to read out. We got some. We got some. Sorry. I have so many screenshots from our reviews. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Apparently, from Bo Oxley. Apparently, Barb and I were made 10 million. Australian this opening weekend in the cinema chain event cinemas alone in one of the six states of Australia. This beat Endgame's opening weekend. Um, I'm trying to make sense of the magnitude of this. If it doesn't make sense to you, unsubscribed! I didn't. That's it's huge everywhere. That's crazy. Yeah. Then, um... <laughs> Asim, I was DMing uh, Asim... And he said, thank you so much. I will never unsubscribe. <laughs> Thanks, pal. <laughs> we appreciate it. Um, okay. So Molly Skogan, after we posted our our Barbie fits, and she said, outserved my Oppenheimer and Barbie fit. Unsubscribed. <laughs> we were looking pretty sharp on those. We got so many great comments on the Barbie fits. Yeah, we did. Yeah, it was, that was a fun one. It was really sweet. Yeah. I loved reading them. They it cracked fun- me up. Yeah. Um, the, Ken- <laughs> the Kennergy. This is a great one. Alice, I guess. Oppenheimer before Barbie? Unsubscribed! <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. All right, that's all of them. Did we film our episode for Oppenheimer before we saw Barbie? No, but we, we posted that we were there. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, it was, it's on the, the schedule post you made of upcoming episodes. Gotcha, gotcha. Where you did Mission Possible, then Oppenheimer, oh, Okay, then gotcha. That was, a, that was a good post. 
Yeah, it was pretty good. Co- pretty good post. <laughs> Guess. No, people got like because I think I want to start doing that. We're showing the schedule of upcoming episodes and like it's a great idea, man. People are like, people you should are, do. You know what you should do? You should do a grid. A grid. Yeah, rather than the scroll. Ooh, a grid's a good idea. Grid's are nice. Grid's wow. are tight. That is a that's a good idea, Anthony. Yeah. So I'll you make, can do like in the top left, it says upcoming episodes, and then a photo for three movies. That's a good idea. So the four photos. Oh yeah, exactly. Exact mundo, or even three photos. You get you're you're picking up what I'm putting down. Well, you, when you do three photos, they show up. So that was a three photo post. No, no, as a grid. Not for Twitter. I'm a, an Instagram grid. Oh, gotcha. Like a photo grid. I see. You know, you understand what I'm Capito. saying. All right, moving on to our five star review from Michael Ben and Jordan, number one movie podcast. This is my favorite podcast to listen to. The amount of passion, work ethic, entertainment, and excitement these guys bring to film is, and TV is amazing. They also push me to watch movies that I didn't know about. And to think into that, I thank them. Also, they're awesome dudes overall and put in a lot of effort. It's wild. I'm talking multiple episodes throughout the week. It's what made me believe there's actually two of them and not one cloning himself. (laughs) But the most impressive thing about them is their brain memory. These guys can remember when each movie was made, each line, who directed it, the DP, and they can probably recite every movie's ending credits from start to finish. (laughs) Yes, the credits that roll out at the end of the movie. (laughs) No problem, especially the visual effects artists. I didn't know you wanted thousands of them. Michael, I had no idea you wanted us to do that. Yeah, let's start at the end of this episode where we recite every single single person in the film. That's a great review. Marvel movies and DC movies will be tough because there's 7,000 artists. Man. You don't know them all? You don't know them all? <laughs> Only like half. Looks like you didn't do your research. Michael, thank you so much for the five-star view on Apple. We appreciate it. And you will be entered into the contest for oh, yeah. our movie poster contest this week. We got a lot of entrants so far. Appreciate it so much. Now, streaming recommendation this week. Mine is Past Lives. This just got put on Apple on June 23rd this week. Oh, wow. Apple got it. Yeah. Oh, A24 partnership. Yeah, yeah. So if you did not get a chance to see this in theaters, which I know most people didn't, it did not perform very well, I can't recommend seeing this film enough. If you don't have Apple, then I just recommend renting it on Amazon. It's really worth the watch. It's incredible. It's my number three on the year. It was my number one movie until July hit theaters because then obviously Oppie and then Mission Impossible, but it's number three for me on on the entire 2023 year so far. I adored it. It's beautiful. I love action, massive blockbusters, but as much as I love those, I love independent films about people, and this is that. It's a special movie this year, and I can't recommend it enough. Oh, James. <laughs> <laughs> it's also my number three movie of the year, but uh, it's over Mission Impossible for me. I got... Oh, you're gonna have to tune into our Real Talk episode to see our top ten list. Oh yeah, Real Talk's dropping on Monday. Us and Real Talk crossover episode on both platforms. We did all we all did our top ten of the year so far. So you'll find out our top tens on that episode on Monday. But my streamer recommendation, I wanted to go in the opposite direction of all the the colors and pastels of this movie, and I found Men in Black. That's on Amazon Prime. <laughs> <laughs> just black and white outfits compared to the colorful outfits of this of this movie so i thought it was a nice contrast also it's just a great movie it's a childhood favorite it was our first dvd it was yeah in black we got for our birthday yeah great movie it was fun how much were dvds back then like a hundred dollars no <laughs> they were, they were 20 like bucks. 20 bucks 15 yeah. 20 bucks they weren't too bad <laughs> not that bad all right you ready to get back into barbie i'm ready let's talk about the cast because obviously margot robbie is a superstar and probably the biggest actress on the planet right now now so talented i would say she never had the box office success success until this movie probably she's had just lukewarm box office not this i mean she's obviously one of the most talented actors alive right now when but she's she, a lead yeah. yeah she's got no movies that have huge hits like this and so this was like huge for her career i think going forward she and she's already like been a force to be reckoned with because she produces a lot of her own movies so i'm glad that she finally got the big success and she's so talented and the amount of times that she's switching these wild emotions from being this excited barbie doll then being very human and a barbie doll ch- like challenged with human emotions and complexities of anxiety of stress depression depression barbie <laughs> and she cries i think seven or eight times on cue in this film, Crazy. whether she's smiling through crying or, or depressed about something. It's really a sensational performance. The, the range that Margot Robbie has in a repertoire of 
her talent as an actress. Phenomenal. The perfect lead. I really couldn't imagine anybody else taking on this role as stereotypical Barbie. It had to be her because she has the stereotypical, you know, classic beauty look. So it it fits perfectly as stereotypical Barbie. It had to be her. And she's sensational. And she, you know, she puts this movie on her shoulders and carries it so well. Someone terrific. else carries it too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Our boy. Well, basically, we're all like him. Yeah. He's literally me. <laughs> Ryan Gosling is outstanding in this. And I... I think that Margot and Gosling were the only reason why the movie... Like, I don't think any other actors could have pulled it off like they did. The movie still would have worked, but uh, Margot was absolutely sensational, and Gosling was fucking great as Ken. Because he... he the thing is, Gosling already has that, like, weird... to Like, that weird, somehow, like, this connection to the young... To, to men already. You know what I mean? We're all Like, we him. all... Think we're Ryan yeah. Gosling. <laughs> this weird thing has happened with men's relationship to Ryan Gosling that it's not like any other actor where it's like we're all in love with him. You yeah, know we what I mean? are. And that's, <laughs> we why, are. that's why it works. And because he's also such a talented actor, but also a great comedian too. And he's he's always been great at self-deprecating humor. And so Ken is defined by like self-deprecating humor in this movie. So it, it just seemed like if they didn't have, if they couldn't get Gosling, they probably would have gone with maybe Hemsworth or Reynolds. I don't think it would have worked, or even Evans. I don't think it would have worked with any of them. I think that Gosling was really the only guy that could have pulled this role off as perfectly as he did. He's such a funny actor. I mean, I feel like people always forget it. If you've never seen The Nice Guys, watch that. He is hysterical in that movie. I still think about the scene where he's breaking into the window and he punches the glass, but then he slits his wrist open. That's a lot of blood. That's a lot of blood. <laughs> he's so fucking funny. That's a lot of blood. And he nailed this role. I was not, I did not know what to expect from Ryan in this role. Yeah. I was curious. The trailer obviously didn't allude to too much of the ridiculous sarcasm and self-deprecating humor that you talked about because the, the trailer really focuses on Barbie. We have some great shots of Ken saying some funny lines and terrific outfits, but what he brought to the third act of this movie, the last 35 minutes, was awesome. And the concept of Ken, all of the Kens, like I said, being the platonic friends of Barbie when they want them around, which is not that often. And then the concept of Ken going to the real world with Barbie persistently and then discovering the patriarchy <laughs> and then bringing him back to Barbie land. I thought it was so fucking hysterical. It was great. And Horses. Just, when, when Ken discovers the patriarchy, he's like, first thing, I'm going to go to the library and see if there's any truck books on trucks. <laughs> just like these stupid things that boys are He goes to fucking with. Century City. <laughs> if you live in Los Angeles, that joke, like in LA, I'm sure, I'm sure other theaters, it might not have hit as hard, that joke. But in our theater, the entire theater erupted because Century City... It's just like the perfect like materialistic like yeah, it's, business it's like a fake world. business fused with uh with uh materialism Consumer, consumerism, yeah. It was like it's the perfect place for Ken to discover uh, America like uh, America in the patriarchy. It's and like right I near fucking, Beverly Hills I fucking in the west died. side. I it, died it when you said those Century cultures. City. It yeah. was hysterical and I think then Ken going off the off the deep end with the patriarchy in Barbie Land and it was it was perfect. I thought his his role was terrific, and like Anthony said, he was he said I'm gonna take this role because my daughter's Ken doll is face down in the mud. Now Ryan Gosling's Ken was also inspired by the appearance of Sun Love and Malibu Ken from 1979, who also wore turquoise swimwear and had blonde hair with a tan skin and he blonde, does beach blonde fragility, <laughs> and <laughs> to fit into the role of Ken, Ryan Gosling drew influence from his time on the Disney show. The all-new Mickey Mouse Club from 1989, he said, At a certain point, I thought I had left that kid behind. I realized that I needed his help to make this movie, so I had to go back and make peace with him and ask for his help. It was good for me. And remember, like, four or five years ago, that video of him dancing as, like, a, an 11-year-old sure, yeah. on stage with all those girls? With the big pants. Yeah, it's hysterical. Like, he's that, that's him in this movie. It's yeah. terrific. He's born for this role. The hair's the same. <laughs> <laughs> the dance sequences are terrific. They're so funny. The dance sequence was funny phenomenal the first one too but like yeah. the first one's so funny because the kens are against each other and ken's trying because yeah. every ken has their own barbie and ken gosling's ken is trying to always get the attention of his barbie even though all the other kens are also vying for it as well and it's just hysterical like the the faces he pulls when he's doing that dance routine and <laughs> with the golden cup that he just tosses away <laughs> and composer mark runson wrote the song i'm just ken 
largely as a joke and recorded a demo for Greta Gerwig, not seriously expecting it to be included on the soundtrack. However, she liked the song, and when she shared it with Ryan Gosling, he felt so strongly that it added to the character of Ken, he successfully advocated for it to be made a musical number in the film, which it did, and Ronson remarked that he was amazed how much Gosling's interpretation of the song improved upon his original intent. Yeah, the, the Ken song was absolutely phenomenal because people kept saying online how great it was, but I, I, I wanted to save it for the movie. I didn't want to listen to it because I wanted, you know, that first experience Same. with it. And the musical number was unbelievable, and it was so much fun. Uh, it, I, I, I'm I, just yeah. Ken. Oh, my God. It was just fantastic. And then the set changes, and then eventually the Kens all, like, are dancing together as friends. <laughs> it was just fantastic. And But also the Push song was great. Uh, the campfire acoustic set. I feel like I got called out on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you love that. She, you played acoustic guitar to girls. I have <laughs> <laughs> many times. I was like, this is about me. <laughs> but when but uh, not that song, not that song. Yeah, not that song. Yeah, but that song was it was a perfect song. And Go- I mean, Gosling's a great talent, and uh, we all know he can sing. He's in. He he's had a band for years, and he's also done La La Land. We all know he he can sing, but. I think it was smart of Greta to embrace his other talent as a singer and a performer uh, to put that into the film because it really put the movie on another level, I think, having the musical numbers. And the acoustic set singing push destroyed me. I was dying, especially when you think it's just him playing to her in the campfire. <laughs> and then she pulls the camera back and there's all the Kens are playing the song to their Barbies. I fucking lost it. I was, I was dying. I, I literally clapped. I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And let's go over the, some more of these characters and actors. Obviously, so many of the other Barbies. We have Issa Rae, Kate McKinnon, Alexandra Ship, Emma McKay, Harry Neff, Dua Lipa, Anna Cruz Kane, Ritu Aria, Sharon Rooney, Nicola Coughlin, as well as Simu Liu as a Ken, uh, Nucci Gatwa, Kingsley Benadir, Scott Evans, John Cena is in there. So many amazing actors and actresses playing the Kens and Barbies as well as America Ferreira as Gloria is a huge role in this film. And I was curious what her character was going to be like. And we end up finding out that she is this mother who is going through bouts of anxiety and depression. She's not connecting with her daughter, Sasha. And she has discovered her daughter, Sasha's old Barbie dolls. When when Barbie starts learns from weird Barbie, Kate McKinnon's Barbie, that you have to find that connection with that little girl who's playing with your toy and she's fi- she sees the little girl. She sees Sasha, but it's really Sasha's mother, Gloria, who's been playing with the Barbie doll. And that's the connection that's made. And and they sort of just kind of complement each other so much. And it's a really beautiful relationship that they discover. And so basically the plot, we follow oh, Barbie. You forgot Alan. Alan Michael by Michael Sarah. Sarah. Don't forget Ken's Alan. Friend. He's Ken's buddy. <laughs> All his clothes fit him. <laughs> <laughs> now, so the plot, obviously... Barbie and a persistent Ken go into the real world so that Barbie can track down this little girl who's sad and upset and try to cheer her up so that everything can go back to normal in her perfect life in Barbie land. However, they eventually find out when they split up their paths that Barbie's fr- G- Sasha doesn't care about Barbies anymore. She destroys Barbies to her face at school, which was kind of mean, but also accurate. And then, hey, the friend warned her. Yeah, the friend did warn don't, her. Don't talk she'll to Sasha. Destroy, yeah. Sasha will destroy you. While Ken goes and discovers the patriarchy. <laughs> well, she called. She respects me. And she then we find out that Gloria, Sasha's mom, works at Mattel, where Will Ferrell and all the board members are in control of Barbie Land and the Barbies and Kens, as well as she's going through bouts of depression, anxiety, and that's why she picked up the Barbie toy to try to find something to bring her a little joy because she's not connecting with her daughter. She's not really connecting with anybody. And then we're on a path of getting the Barbies basically back to Barbie land as a team in a way. And then humans entering Barbie land, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> I will say that I, – so I gave this a four out of five, and I knocked it down to four um, because I think – for me, the real-world sequences didn't quite work as well. Um, it, it, the, the, the comedy wasn't quite there, um, and it was a little too – a little tongue-in-cheek and a little too cringe sometimes. Uh, so I will. I had to knock it down a, a star in my rating because I just felt like I lost a connection in the human world. Um, and also, I would have liked uh, more character development between Gloria and Sasha um, and even the father as well in the family because they told us that there were problems, but we didn't 
we didn't know where they stem from. We didn't know what the actual issues were. Obviously, they're not connected as mother or daughter anymore. But I think for me, I would have liked to see more of that relationship and what brought about this kind of estrangement between mother and daughter. Um, so I think that there was just a little, a little missing for me from the human world. And I like the idea of going to the human world and then bringing humans back to Barbie land. Um, but for me, I think I would have liked a little bit more between Gloria and Sasha. Yeah, so when it comes to Gloria, we never really addressed her thoughts of death yeah. and depression and anxiety outside of, you know, the effects of patriarchy in the real world on her life and, and, and she, womanhood I mean, and motherhood. And that great, great monologue she so has. So terrific yeah. monologue. But I, was, I wanted to know more about what's causing her thoughts of death and what kind of depression is she going through. And I think that the father, I agree, was a bit of a missed opportunity here. Very funny Duolingo joke, and then, si se puedes at the, at the <laughs> end. Biblioteca. He said, uh, no, uh, baligrafos. 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 So I think Sasha's father, I would have liked to see more of the father because, you know, I thought Gloria was a single mom for almost the entire Sam, movie. Sam, I thought she was a single mom, <laughs> yeah. And again, the Duolingo joke was funny, but I feel like he got done a little dirty. I think a father is a huge important person in a daughter's life and a girl's life and for any family. Sure. And there are a lot of really great dads out there. And he seems like a good dad. Yeah. And seems so like he's trying. He was in two <laughs> shots. I feel like he could have been added as part of the family adventure and as well as helping to understand why his wife is depressed. Is he that's the cause great, of it? That's great. Why is she having thoughts of death? So I think that if the dad could have been incorporated more to – connect with Gloria and Sasha more with the audience. Why is Gloria depressed? Why is Sasha so against her mother? Obviously teen angst, but I think the family dynamic would have worked so much better if we got more of the dad involved and why everyone's feeling these ways. Yeah, that's a great um, plot trajectory. They could have evolved as a family. Maybe he was like unaware and it showed that, you know, he wasn't paying attention to his wife. And I think there, there could, could have been some really great family dynamics with that story. So for me, I think they went back to Barbie Land too quickly. Obviously, the plot called for it, but I agree. I think that um, maybe if they showed the family in earlier scenes to get us a little more screen time with them, it would have worked better. Uh, but I, I totally agree. I think that the family dynamic it was just uh, it was just missing some more punch. Yeah, I, he could have gone to Barbie Land with them, been a fake Ken to help them on their coup of the coup <laughs> because the Ken. It'd be coup. funny if he was trying to blend in with other. Yeah, Kens. I think that, that could. Be, that would be I funny. think that was a missed yeah. opportunity because I thought she was a single mom. Yeah. For like an hour and a half, <laughs> I was like, "Who's the, oh? Th there's a dad." I thought that my interpretation for the first half of the film was like maybe the dad died. I in, thought in he was family. dead or divorced yeah. or yeah, something. Exactly. Yeah. So I I, I would have liked to see more dad, but actually. America, a glorious husband in the film is actually played by America Ferrara's husband in real life, Ryan Pierce Williams. Uh -huh. so oh, fun thank you. Fact. And I agree with the real, real world. I loved being in Barbie Land, and when they went to the real world, it I think it would have benefited to be more like Elf and more like Enchanted, where the real world is a lot more realistic. Because I felt like there were so many elements about the real world that were as unrealistic as Barbie Land and as uh -huh. fantastical. Which kind of made it seem like is the, the real tone world shift. is the yeah. real world that much different than Barbie Land in a lot of ways? Mm -hmm. But I think it was fine because the tone it, the, the tone was definitely a shift, and I think it lost the audience for about 10, 15 minutes in the middle. People weren't really laughing. They at weren't reacting. Yeah. We were in a packed packed audience yeah. opening weekend, opening day, I think, and so I think it lost the audience for about ten minutes in the real world. Mm -hmm. It was a little, I think, a little heavy handed. I think a little more nuance could have benefited in terms of what they're trying to say because we all understand what they're trying to say. Yeah. But it still worked to keep the, the movie going. And when we went back to Barbie land, when Ken got there first, then Barbie shows up with Gloria and Sasha. Yeah. The, the movie really continued to perform so well for me. In the last 35 millions, I adored of this movie. Does this movie hate men? Is it an attack on men? Is it an attack on mis masculinity? Is every guy horrible? Of course every guy isn't a horrible, evil, sexist, misogynist <laughs> jerk or a complete oblivious doofus. But I think that we have to understand the lens of what this movie is being told. This is a movie made by a woman for a woman for these girls that grew up playing with Barbies. And also it's a movie about toys coming to life in the yeah. real world, basically. So I think that... When you understand the lens for who the movie was really made for, and I'm not saying it's not made for men as well. We've been talking about plenty of the great discourse that it has for men and the the effect that consumerism and media and, and culture has had on, to, um, on masculinity for men, what we're supposed to like. 
But I think when you understand the lens of the, who this film is made for, I, I don't. I didn't get upset by it. I was I was expecting plenty of that to be yeah, in the yeah. movie, but I, it didn't upset me. And I don't think the movie's anti man. I think they're just you know it's it's just excessive to to the point where it's just a movie. You know what I mean? At no, the, yeah. At the I, same I think, time, I think in a lot of ways the movie's pro man, um, especially by the third act. And I think it's also encouraging for men as well. So I think that men who get upset about this film, either they're dealing with a lot of deep insecurity and anger issues, um, or they're not understanding what the movie's messaging was at all. Because I, I saw a lot of great messages geared specifically just for men. And a lot, I think a lot of young boys can watch this movie and take a lot away from it. And I took a lot away from it. And so I think that men who are getting upset by this movie... I think it's their own problem and their own their own reasoning behind it. it. And objectively, if you watch this movie, it's not anti-men whatsoever. What's the movie called? Barbie. It's called Barbie. It's a Barbie Chill movie. Chill the fuck out. Yeah, <laughs> Seriously, Barbie it's called Barbie. It's about Barbies. It's not about you. So it's just a movie. <laughs> like, it's not, it's not that big of a deal. Let them have something. Let them have it. <laughs> Seriously. Let them have it. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I'm sorry that a movie called Barbie didn't portray every man as a perfect human being, but maybe that's part of the insecurity that you're feeling, or people feel when they see this movie. Because but also, but also, the movie does go after women too. You yeah. know, America Ferrara says, you know, men hate women, women hate women. It's complicated, and so she, they didn't say women are perfect. That I think that was important because it was so well done. It was very nuanced. It wasn't like men are the only problem. Women have no problems whatsoever. They were like, you know, everybody has to work together to pave a new, a better way forward. And I think it was so important not to just point the finger at men. You know what I mean? I think America for Our speech was really fantastic and really hammered home what exactly uh, Gerwig was trying to say about our culture. And also Barbie coming to terms with she's not perfect anymore and there's nothing wrong with that because nobody is perfect, Barbie. Even even stereotypical Barbie is not par- is not perfect. And I think that was a really important message at the end of the film as well. But the the third act when Barbie with Sasha and Gloria get back to Barbie Land, mm-hmm. and Ken has been there for like a couple hours. He's already <laughs> turned Barbie Land into Ken Ken World, Ken Kendom Kendom. <laughs> Kendom. I absolutely love this. It was so funny. It was it was hysterical. It was really clever and. You know, part of me is like, how did he take over Barbie Land so quickly? But I think it's just the specific wording deprogrammed the Barbies to an ex- to the yeah. point where they accept what was said to them in like the perfect phrasing. And Ken, like when he finds out, like men rule the world in the real world, and he's like, <laughs> I, I gotta get this back. I gotta tell the Kens about this. Yeah, yeah. And the Kens are so full of themselves and the Mojo Dojo Casa house. When Barbie in the plan for the coup goes to his house to ask to be his girl, his uh. Long term, kind of casual, somewhat girlfriend. <laughs> he goes, he goes, excuse me one second. He goes inside the house, sublime! <laughs> sublime! <laughs> and then the coup is great. You know, the Barbies get together. They're deep programming each other secretly by playing to the biggest, the most hubris parts of Ken and their arrogance and obsessive, mm-hmm. like telling them like oh can you teach me how to watch this movie teach me about the godfather um can you change this for me oh, i can help Fe- you with feigning that feigning ignorance let me show yeah. you let me show you how to do that you uh, haven't seen the godfather <laughs> and then the coup is great and- well before the coup i think that gerwig perfectly um showcased the the futility and the argument against the patriarchy existing because I think the most common argument people say is, you know, half the world is women. Why don't they just rise up and take power of everything? Um, because first of all, Greta Gerwig shows how the woman, the, the Barbies get, like you said, brainwashed. They're deep, they're reprogrammed into this kind of mentality of not even believing they can do anything and believing that, you know, their purpose is to serve, their purpose is to pl- please, their, their purpose is to... Um, um, serve the Kens in a way. And so the film perfectly demonstrates that with the deprogramming of the Barbies and how they don't even become, they're not even um, individuals anymore. They are now just the Kens thing, the Kens objects, the Kens um, servants in a way. And so she she perfectly demonstrated that in a way the patriarchy, I would say, that Bar- that Greg Ulrich is saying is that it deprograms women in a way of thinking they're, it's, they're incapable of taking power and there, there's no way forward for them. 
And that's what she did in the movie when Ken brought the patriarchy to Barbie Land. Good point. And uh, the coup's clever because they're voting for new constitution, so they have to get control of the vote and the Barbies and the Kens. <laughs> And they distract the Kens by pitting them against each other, that campfire scene. The jealousy. Where they all yeah. go and talk to the other Kens that are playing the exact same song. And then the Kens decide to go to war with each other. There are two factions of the Kens. There's Ken, Barbie's stereotypical Ken, and then Simu Leo's Ken. And they go to war. And I love the war scene, getting onto the beach, the shores, like the, the fake bow and arrows. And then Will Ferrell and the humans are like, can you get hurt by these? Oh, no, they're just toys. <laughs> One of them gets shot. And then the Kens are just like kind of using their... Ken essence to stop Their each abs. other. He like opens up his shirt and just like yeah the ab- <laughs> the power of the abs pushes somebody away. But then cutting to the dance number and the all black outfits, the grease reference. I think that was my favorite scene in the entire movie was the Ken dance number. It was terrific, fantastic. I think the showstopper for me in this movie. And then they lose out. They realize that there was a coup, and the Barbies got control of the Constitution and made a vote. <laughs> to I love power it. back in Barbie. I love it. But I like how that's not the end because then we have to get more of an existential ending where Barbie has been – everyone's kind of deprogrammed and kind of understanding their worth in the world. The Kens are being deprogrammed too by Barbie being like, you don't need me. You can find your own purpose in life. You need to find out who Ken is because you are Kenuff. They're stripping themselves of fantasy. And entering reality and finding the individuality within themselves. I look so stupid! (laughs) (laughs) Ken is me. Ken is me. (laughs) To be honest, when I found out the patriarchy wasn't about horses, I got, I lost interest. (laughs) (laughs) The fucking horse, the horse necklace, the beers. The mini fridge is so small and practical. The the freezer's a joke! (laughs) Could only fit a six pack in there. (laughs) Oh my god, I died. And I love uh, Will Ferrell's CEO, like, defending, like, we have we had a woman CEO like a couple decades ago <laughs> and then there was another one there was another one some time ago so that's two <laughs> that's two right there <laughs> I will say not every one of Will's jokes hit for me usually they do but he was 50-50 for me in this movie second half way better I think in his jokes yeah, landed. Yeah. And it's, then the, it's just the real world yeah the, I, the comedy wasn't quite the same and then when he's like so what is it, child? Or like, Tell me can, your dream, sweet child. You can call me mother. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, but I really enjoyed the the existential, uh, metaphorical conversation she has with Ruth, the creator of Barbie. Um, it's a really beautiful scene of Barbie choosing to become uh, a real person, of choosing to become a human being, and seeing what happens, and um, denying the continuation of fantasy. And then I, the the ending of the movie was just so fantastic because they set it up. She Greta kind of hid the set with the framing. And you think that – is she going in for a job interview or something? Yeah. That's what I was expecting. And then she says, I'm here to see my gynecologist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a great ending. I loved it. It was terrific. The music was phenomenal. There's a great soundtrack as well as the Ken song is great. Gosling's cover of Push by Matchbox 20 was phenomenal. I listened to that on Spotify a few times. It's so great. So – I think this movie overall. Well, I will. Well, I will. <laughs> I had a great time. I, I gave it four out of five stars on my letterboxed. Really enjoyed it. One of my favorite of the year. It's in my top ten. I think I put it at six. I have it at six. Ten, six or seven. Yeah. And I didn't think I would like a mo- a Barbie movie this much, but goddamn, I, I enjoyed the fuck out of it. The thing is, it really worked. I think it has a high rewatch fa- factor. To Absolutely. It. This is going to be a, a very popular movie for. Forever, forever. <laughs> um, and I mean, don't I mean, Greta Greta was always building to this. Uh, don't forget, Lady Bird was A24's most successful film until Hereditary came out, and then Little Woman made over a hundred million dollars for a period piece um, set during the Civil War. Uh, so her movies have slowly been building in success until this absolute juggernaut of a movie, which looks like it could uh, approach a billion dollars easily. I love the intercuts of the silly commercials of the of the girls and boys playing with Barbies. Yeah. And I like the depression Barbie. Depression Barbie. Just watch Pride and Prejudice eating like a pack of oh a my box God, of chocolate yeah. or something like See, that. See, like Colin Firth as Darcy. I, I died. I died. <laughs> the TV version of Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some really good ones. Uh, I, I love the, the, the magic realism she included in the film was just really fantastic throughout. And my God, Gosling's comedic timing is so goddamn good. So goddamn good. 
there was a scene that the studio wanted Greta to cut, but she was adamant to keep it in. So it was the old lady on the bench when mm-hmm. Barbie, you know, she's crying. Then she sees the old lady to her right, and she says, you're beautiful. And she says, I know it. Now, Greta Gerwig, refu- she refused to cut the scene, holding her ground against the studio executive saying, I love that scene so much. And the older woman on the bench is costume designer Anne Roth. She's a legend. It's a cul-de-sac of a moment in a way. It doesn't lead anywhere. And in early cuts, looking at the movie, it was suggested, well, you could cut it, and actually the story would move on just the same. And Greta said, if I cut that scene, I don't know what this movie is about. That's a great point because the studio exec is just thinking of how can we make it faster rather than understanding what is the representation of the scene and what what is the point of having the scene there. They don't care. They're, they're not thinking about that, but Greta is understanding like they're – the humanity of this scene and its importance is paramount to the movie working. And what is beauty? Yeah. And does beauty have an expiration date? I think yeah. that's one of the great parts of that scene is it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. Just ex- studio execs being studio execs, well, bro. Well, like, I don't get the scene. Like, why do we need it? Is it like... We, we just cut out, like, we cut out like a minute. Like, <laughs> like do you never see her again? Like, what's the point? <laughs> that's that's talking from like a uh, just a literal sense of like, what's, why is the scene here in terms of uh, the thematic reason why the scene's there. So, good for her. All right, that wraps, I think, Barbie for me. You got anything else? I loved it. it All right, great. really hope you enjoyed this episode of Barbie. This has been Barbenheimer week, so we did our Oppenheimer review on Monday, so definitely check that out if you haven't seen it. What a weekend and what a week at the cinema, at the movies, the biggest theatrical weekend since Avengers Endgame. These two movies were so important, bringing events back to the cinema Going out, taking photos at the theater, dressing up. I've never seen a phenomenon like this where everyone is dressing up as pink. Girls, guys, kids, girls, boys. It's insane. Woman, everyone's decked out in pink, powder blue, whatever. It's phenomenal to see people having so much fun and enjoying an experience together. And reminding people how important theaters are, how important movies are being seen in a theater with a bunch of other people. How much fun it can be. An incredible social experience. Thank you, Greta Gerwig, for this incredible movie, this incredible experience. Barbenheimer, what a phenomenon. Take we, care. we did it, guys. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you next time, everyone. This episode was executive produced by our Chosen One patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Becca Keen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Nicholas Martin, Darian, Tyler McFly, and Sal Koching. Our Chosen One patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button as well. Notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere. You can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.